Hello there, this is Mark Summers again from Summers Technical Services. We're going to do a uh, computational fluid dynamics CFD analysis on heat sink. And it looks something like this with some aluminum, aluminum part uh, about this size. Everybody's going to have their own unique heat sink. And the uh, characteristic of heat sinks is they got lots of surface area. And so you'll see with all these fins maximizes the surface area which is going to maximize our heat dissipation so let's uh, go through the steps we're going to build the model based on your unique parameters I gave you earlier and you're going to uh, run the analysis as a natural convection heat transfer which is when we have no wind blowing over the heat sink it's just sitting in still air and the heat transfers to the air through natural convection and we're going to also do an analysis with force convection where we blow air across the fins and that will increase the heat transfer and lower the temperature of the heat sink with the same given heat load at the bottom. So we'll do both of those analysis and then we'll compare those values to the uh, manufacturer's data sheet and make sure those correlate so that we are confident that our analysis is correct. So let's get started. Okay, here we are with uh, SOLIDWORKS. I've already built my model. And so we can look at this thing from the front and see that my sketch, I've taken advantage of a lot of geometric constraints because all these are equal. And so these are all equal length edges. These are all equal length edges down here. And I've got a minimum number of dimensions because I don't need a lot of dimensions because this thing has got a lot of uh, symmetry since these fins are all equally spaced in the same size. So you can build your model in inches or millimeters either way you want to go. Uh, the other thing I did was when I extruded this first feature, uh, I extruded it uh, mid-plane in both directions so that this front plane is in the middle of the part and that makes it easier for me to make this sketch on the bottom face the sketch here is what we're going to use in the simulation to split this bottom face into two separate areas. One is inside of the one by one square and everything else is on the outside. Because I only want to apply the heat load to this one inch by one inch square here. So we're going to create that sketch on the bottom, not use it as an extrude or anything, just to have that sketch there. So we can apply that heat load later. Alright, so the model is ready to go. I applied my material. And now we're ready to run the flow analysis. So the first thing you're going to want to do is go Tools, Add-ins, and make sure you have your SolidWorks flow simulation uh, turned on. There's a checkbox to turn it on this time, and there's a checkbox to turn it on every time. So make sure that's turned on. When you do that, you may have to right-click on the tab and turn on your add-ons so you get a tab that looks like this right here. So let's start the uh, flow simulation. What we'll do when we go to flow simulation tab, we've got buttons up here and the first thing we're going to do is use the wizard. The wizard will walk us through the, the uh, configuration for the analysis. So let's hit the wizard and go through and answer these questions carefully so we don't uh, get the wrong analysis. So I'm going to give it a project name, so I'll call it NRG-036. SO7B maybe, and I give it some comments, and I'll say next. And I believe I'm using inch units, so I'll use uh, inch pounds seconds. However, I want my temperatures to be in Celsius, and so I may change that to make the temperatures in Celsius. And I want the heat loads to be in watts. These uh, BTUs are not what I want for my heat stuff. So I'm going to come down and change energy to joules, heat flow is watts, and heat flux is watts per square meter. So I'm mixing the units, and we can go back and change these later. Uh, it keeps track of all the units, so you can have a mixture of any kind of units you want, which is kind of handy. All right, so we'll go next. And here's where I've got to make a big decision. Internal flow versus external flow. Internal flow is flow going like through a duct. 
and all the flow is contained inside some geometry. This is an external problem. The flow is on the outside. There's nothing going through the inside of my part. So we're going to choose external flow. I don't have any cavities. So don't have to worry about this. Here's where we're going to tell it what kind of uh, assumptions we're making. We want to get heat conduction in solids. That's going to turn on the fact that heat can flow through solids using the thermal conductivity of the material that we've already input after we assign our material. So I want heat conduction in solids. Radiation is another form of heat transfer that doesn't really come into play unless you get pretty high temperatures. And my engineering judgment says this is going to be a low impact, so I'll turn that off net for now. Time dependent means we're going to do a, if I wanted to know what the temperature is doing over time, like how fast it heats up, then I'd want to do a time dependent analysis. It takes a huge more amount of uh, computational resources and time because it has to calculate the temperatures at very small time steps. And we're going to leave that turned off because uh, it'll take too long to run. Gravity we want to turn on when we're doing natural convection. This thing is just sitting in still air, like in this room right here. And the only thing that makes the heat go into the air is when heat, when air heats up, when any fluid heats up, it rises. Hot air rises if you're a debt. And so the density of the air will heat up and it'll go down, which makes it rise. And I need to know which way gravity is pointing because that's how that all operates. So I need to turn on gravity. And in my case, gravity is going in the y direction according to my triad down here. So this is incorrect. I want to make this value go away in the z direction. I'm going to instead put it in the y direction. Oops, what happened to my... Yeah, there was there a minute ago. There we go. 386 inches per second per second is 1g. It's in a minus direction because gravity is going down. And no rotation, no free surface, so I'll go next. And i got to tell it what kind of gases I'm flowing around here. It could be liquids, it could be any of these things, but I'm going to use air, so I'll double click. And air pops in as my default fluid. I can change different flow types. Laminar flow is low flow that, that goes nice and smooth. Turbulent flow is when it's going here, there, and everywhere. It uses different equations. It uses some very complicated Navier-Stokes equations that uh, partial differential equations in three dimensions. And they're so complicated, no one's ever solved them before. So, uh, But numerically, you can solve them, and that's what the program does. And I'm just going to let it figure out if it's probably going to be all laminar, but I'll let the program figure out what equations it needs to do based on the velocity of the flow. Humidity I can turn on if I want, but I'll just leave it off. So I'll go next. So this wizard is pretty nice. Alloys, uh, solids in the model. There's my solid right there, so I'm going to apply that. That's the default solid. And I'll say next. Uh, yes, I want to add it. All right, roughness, we're going to assume is zero roughness. If we've got high velocity flow in a tube, the surface roughness of the tube due to this Moody friction factor that you'll learn about if you take my fluid dynamics class comes into play, but we're going to assume zero roughness. And here are the uh, ambient conditions. Atmospheric pressure is, is one standard atmosphere, about 14.7 psi. We'll leave that like it is. I want the ambient temperature to be... 68 degrees F. So you notice if I type in 60 degree 8 F and hit enter, it converts it to Celsius because I told it earlier that I want everything to be in Celsius. So it does a really good job of handling temperatures. Uh, for the first part of the analysis, we're going to have no flow. And so I'm going to leave these velocities at zero. And there's some other parameters down here. We need to change this initial solid temperature. We told it up here the initial temperature of the air is going to be 68 degrees Fahrenheit and we're going to tell it the initial temperature of the aluminum is also going to be 68 degrees Fahrenheit and we're done. So the wizard really does a good job walking you through asking these questions and then we'll say finish and what it does is it creates a computational domain around my part, my heat sink. And so what I need to do is this computational domain, the default size it uses is way bigger than I need because 
there's not really much going on way out here on this perimeter. Everything's going to be happening right here, and so I could leave it like this, but it would highly increase the computation time, and it's not going to give me much better answer. So you'll notice over here, we're now in a different tree over here. We're on the tab, the Flow Simulation Analysis tab. So we're going to get a different tree. If I want to go back to the model, I click the Feature Manager. If I want to go to a Configuration or an Exploded View or something, I go to Configuration Manager. So now we're in another manager, which is this Flow Simulation Manager. And I get my box down here, uh, or my uh, new feature tree down here, if you will. So I want to select boundary conditions, and I'm going to resize this thing. And so once I select this thing and it wakes up, I will be able to drag these corners around and make this bounding box much smaller so that it runs a lot quicker. And there we go. Computational domain. And so what I like to do is pull these arrows in symmetrically and a good rule of thumb is to have enough space so you could have another one of these parts fit between the edge of the computational domain so something like that maybe seems reasonable I can drag this thing over what's going on here click and hold Summers Well, I can type in the numbers here. So if I right-click on computational domain, edit, edit, I can type in the numbers manually. I'm not sure why it's not going to drag it. So maybe I'll make this uh, 4 inches and minus 4 inches. That seems reasonable. And in the other direction, I'll make it, uh, in the Z direction, I'll make it 4 inches and minus 4 inches. So these will change depending on how big your heat sink is. And maybe up and down, I'll go from minus one. Maybe I'll go a little taller. I want to make sure that air, I capture that air rising on the top. So maybe I'll make it go up six inches. So that seems like a reasonable computational domain. Maybe I can make it a little bigger, but maybe it'll be okay. So I'll say okay. Now I can start, uh, I need to add my... Uh, heat load down here. Nothing's going to happen unless I add a heat load. So I'm going to put, start off, I'm going to put 10 watts here, and that 10 watts is going to go into that heat sink. It's going to cause that heat sink to heat up, and the heat sink is going to continue to heat up until it gets hot enough to push all that 10 watts into the air. It's like filling a bathtub. If you put in 10 gallons per minute in a bathtub, and you don't open the drain and let 10 gallons per minute out of the drain, you hold the water there, it's going to fill up and overflow. And so in this case, this thing is going to heat up until it gets hot enough where it can push 10 watts from the surface of the heat sink into the air. So 10 watts is coming in the bottom. By definition, 10 watts has to be coming out of the surface somewhere. So let's add 10 watt heat source here. And so I'm going to come in here to insert, I always forget where these buttons are, tools, somewhere there's a way to get to flow simulation and I'm not seeing it here Am I on flow simulation part mm-hmm Somewhere, maybe this, there we go. Under Tools, Flow Simulation, where did it go? Flow Simulation, Insert, Surface, Source. So Tools, Flow Simulation, Insert, Surface, Source. And it's asking me, i got to see what it's saying here. It says, select the faces to apply. And I want to split this surface and so I've got to find an option to do that so tools flow simulation insert it's 
got to be it. Surface source. There should be another tab here to do a face split. So let's select that. I'm going to put 10 watts on here. And now I've got a tab here. Or on my tree, I've got a heat source here that has a, a steady state heat generation rate of 10 watts. And there's a 10 watts down here. But what I want to do is I don't want it to apply on the whole face. I want it to split this face. And so I need to do that by saying insert features curve here it is curve split line should have done this first so here it's asking for a sketch so I can select it on the screen or I can grab it in the tree so there's the sketch and this is asking for the face to split. I select that face and then say OK. I leave that on projection, I believe. Now this thing is, uh, when I ask you about resetting computational domain, I always say no, because it'll resize it. And I always say no here for the mass settings. All right. So now this thing is split into two separate faces. I should have done this first before I went to the source uh, inputting that 10 watt load. So now you see how to do the face split. Now I'm going to go back and edit this. I got an error here because that face that I had before, the whole bottom is gone. So I'm going to edit definition. Now I'm going to select just that face right there. So now I got 10 watts going on that face, and I say OK. All right, and that's it. I've got a natural convection because there's no airflow. I've got 10 watts at the bottom. I got my material. I got my computational domain, which is air. It's 68 degrees Fahrenheit, and so I'm going to save this thing in case it crashes and burns. And now I'm going to do my mesh. And so if I can find the mesh button here, uh, right here, global mesh. And we could spend weeks and weeks talking about mesh optimization. It's a very important topic. And it controls, just like it did on our structural analysis, controls how long it takes to run, but also controls how accurate our answer is. And since here we've got multiple, we've got some solid elements and some fluid elements, it's even more complicated. So we're going to keep it simple. Global mesh settings, there's a little slider here, like we kind of had on our finite element analysis. You can go from 3 to 4 to 5 to 6 to 7, and it'll just make it a finer and finer mesh. We're going to start off at 3. You can run it if you want to run it higher mesh and see if the answer converges like you did on your structural analysis. That'd be a good idea. I'm going to click on the show basic mesh so I can see it. So I just left it on 3 and said OK. It's a really coarse mesh, but it'll be a good start. And so now that I've got that set, now I can run this thing, which is hitting this button right here. And we're going to do new calculation. I could use other computers. I can go run it on the high power computer down the hallway here if I wanted to, which would be a good idea if I could get in that guy's office. But I'll just run on this computer here and I hit run. And you'll get a little pop up that'll tell you what's happening, give you some messages, some warnings. I'll pop up down here if you got a, uh, errors or warnings. Here I've got a really small number of cells, less than 10,000. Some of them are fluid, some are solid. Some are a combination of both. You can see the iteration is going through, and boom, boom, it uh, it's done. So now what do we do? Well, now we've got this tab down here, results, and it's loaded the results in the tab down here. And it creates these files, or these folders, and you just need to make sure not to move these things around. And here's my part model. Here's this one folder. And it's got all kinds of files in here, but I'm not going to worry about it because it takes care of that. Just don't move these things around because it'll get lost. And if you want to move this to a new computer, that's why we like to keep everything in one folder so you can move it all together. you got to move all these files if you want to move it to another folder, another computer. All right, so we'll leave that uh, alone. 
it's loaded the results and so let's do something here let's do a uh, surface plot so I want to right click and insert a surface plot and I want to ask for the temperatures of the solid on all the faces I'm gonna get it for me Hmm. Not sure that's working for some reason. Uh, let's grab that guy. Yes, I might just select the one at a time here, maybe. All right, so boom, boom, boom. This adds them to the box. And I'll do the same thing over here. It's got to be a faster way. And I might want to see the tops of these things. It's probably going to get a little toasty up there. And so once I get all the faces selected, or at least most of them, and probably want the bottom. Boom, boom. Did I get them all? I don't think I got this guy. Here we go. All right, so now I've got all my faces. I'm asking for the temperature of the solid. Say OK, and I get a nice little contour plot. And we can spin it around to look at this thing in our ISO view. It gives us a nice legend up here. And we can see that the temperature is hottest right in the middle at the bottom. That makes perfect sense. It's kind of raggedy looking, probably because the uh, mesh is pretty coarse. And you can see the temperature of this thing it looks like it's really, really hot in the middle and it's really cold on the tips down here. That's subjective or it's a uh, relative because you're always going to have some spot that's the hottest and some spot that's the coldest. One spot's red, one spot's blue. But there's only a degree and a half temperature difference between out here and out here. So when you start figuring out your temperature of your heat sink, it's not a constant, but we can average these top the numbers and get an average for the overall temperature. So that seems like that's behaving correctly. Uh, you want to always make sure this legend range is correct. So if you double click on these legends and you hit these buttons on the side, that'll reset to the maximum and minimum of the whole part. Sometimes those things change. And so that'll, you might want to check that when you do your analysis. All right. So that was a, uh, that was a uh, surface plot. Now let's do a cut plot. So I can right click and say insert cut plot. And maybe I'll put a cut plot right in my front plane there. And instead of temperatures of the solid, let's ask for the temperature of the fluid across that cross section and then say OK. And now I'm going to turn off, or maybe I'll leave it on. So there's my f fluid temperature, and that's making sense too. It's the hottest in the middle, and it kind of tapers off just a little bit. And as the temperature, or as the air rises, it cools off and it approaches. 68 degrees here at the edge and you can see this range is not correct. So I want to turn off this uh, cut plot I want to hide the cut plot No, I'm going to hide the surface plot. Excuse me. Right click hide and I'm going to uh, Double click on this legend to make sure that that range is going from the maximum fluid temperature to the minimum fluid temperature I know it's not now because uh or maybe it is, maybe it didn't. Let's go check. I'm going to double click on it. And I'm going to hit this button and hit this button. Now it's the full range. So that's what I expect. It drops off to 20 degrees out here, which is uh, room temperature. If I want to see it in Fahrenheit units, uh, I could change my units back up here. If I right click on input data and go to units, I could change it to Fahrenheit if I change my mind. So the temperature or the units are really easy to work with. So 68 to 128, 128 degrees the air temperature, uh, and then it drops off from there. And so we'll do one more thing here. We'll do uh, flow trajectories. It's kind of cool. I'll right click and insert flow trajectory. And I can select points. 
and it's asking for a face and so maybe I'll select points on this bottom face and I'll go pick points and I'll just clickety click on here and just get some points because what it's going to do is going to trace out the path that this error would follow if I track the uh, airflow over time and I want to change this to it's already on temperature of fluid that looks good so I'll say OK and it gives me this nice little uh, vectors that show me which way the flow is going and what temperature the flow is at any point in time so that's pretty cool and I can also right click on it all these things are in my tree now if I right click on flow trajectories and play it I get this nice cool looking thing it's blue that's 68 degree air is coming from the bottom as it flows around and goes through those fins you can see it starts heating up a little bit and as it comes through it heats up maximum right as it goes out the top and then it starts cooling off again so again the three top things you're going to want to do is surface plots cut plots and flow trajectories and then get your get your data that you need that I've asked for in the assignment and then we'll run it again here shortly when we uh, when we do the uh, force convection and so we'll do that in another video so until then uh, run that analysis and go through and get those parameters I need get the screenshots I'm asking for put the uh, data in that spreadsheet and then submit that for the due date so until next time, this again is Mark Summers from Summers Technical Services, and have fun with your simulation.